All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Journey of Faith Online Worship as we begin a new month together, this month of February 2021. I'm starting today by sitting down. Uh, perhaps you're sitting right now, laying down. I'm not sure too many of you are standing, as I often do uh, throughout the worship service. We know normally when we were gathering in person, when we were here in the sanctuary, I would begin worship with a few words and a few moments to just, uh, you know, set the tone and say hello and introduce, of course, the, the band and musicians, and there'd be the praise team and assistant minister and ushers and greeters, and there would be you. But here we are, right? Still gathering in this way where I am talking to you through a camera and somewhere you are out there listening. So it, we're continuing, it's almost a year now that we've been going through this, uh, this time, this pandemic. And there's questions about how long, there's questions about when we'll return we back to in-person worship. And you know, again, for us at Journey of Faith, we wanna to continue to be safe, to practice caution as we can. One of the greatest gifts God has given to us is knowledge, it's wisdom, it's understanding. And unfortunately, it's a gift that too often isn't used. So what began as a novelty in some way is a necessity, necessity for us to gather in this form. Now, I recently bought a new mask. And again, uh, you know, we've all become probably expert mask wearers. As long as you have your keys, your wallet, your phone, and your mask, right? So I got this new mask, which is a N95. These are top of the line. These are the masks they recommend to block everything, and especially to fight against the COVID-19 virus. So I just got them in, and when I first put it on, this is what it looks like. There you go. This is my new mask, which, uh, as my children uh, told me, makes me look like a duck. And my wife has said that she won't wear it. <laughs> But you know what? I'm going to wear it because, first of all, I'll have a mask on. No one's going to know who I am anyways. Number two, it's necessity, not novelty. So quack, 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 quack. I'll be safe. So yes, wear your masks in public. But can I invite you today to do one thing? Invite you right now to take off your mask. Invite you to be yourself. Invite you to be you, to be authentic, to be yourself right now. And especially in the middle of this pandemic when, you know, we're so stressed out doing so much. Right now, take a breath. Be yourself. Be broken. Be real. Be vulnerable. Be human. Open yourself up. Open your heart. Open your mind. And let us together worship the Lord. Amen. So let's begin with a moment of prayer, please, beloved. Lord God, we gather together in the best way we can right now. And we take this time, Lord, to set our hearts upon you, to set our minds upon you. We ask and pray, Lord, that right now that through the singing and through the reading of your word and the preaching of your word, through this moment together, you would strengthen us. You would clarify our calling to always follow you and place our trust in you. Lord, we ask and pray for you to use this sacred moment that we gather to bless us right now. And we pray this and everything in Jesus' name. Let all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Well, we do today have a, a special uh, moment to offer for our youth ministry. Throughout the month of February, we're going to have our Living Wax Museum. Uh, so you're going to hear more about that, the Silver Black History. And today we also have a song. You're going to hear a song after the scripture lesson, sung by Journey's own Cynthia Cousin Williams, who has an angelic voice, uh, just a voice that is filled with so much uh, hope, uh, so much love, and just such a gifted voice. And today she's going to sing for us a sweet hour of prayer. And just a real quick note. When Cynthia came to be recorded, she brought with her a hymnal, a hymnal that her mother gave to her. It's an AME hymnal that Cynthia cherishes and often will sing 
some of our older hymns from. I just thought that was the most, I don't know, the coolest thing, that she brought a hymnal handed from her mother to her. It's like us handing on our faith to future generations. So today we bask in our faith so we can hand on our faith to others. So I hope you enjoy this worship service and I'll be back to preach God's word in a moment. Good morning, Journey of Faith. Happy Sunday. As most of you know, I am Michelle Gahagan and I am the adult leader for Journey of Faith's youth ministry. February 2021 marks the fourth year we have celebrated Black History Month with a Living Wax Museum. The whole premise is built on our young folks becoming leaders from history to share their stories of faith, faith and perseverance. Under normal circumstances, the Living Wax Museum would take place in our fellowship hall and would feature a luncheon for our community. But during the moment of the pandemic, we are completely online and we broke the program up to feature three or four historical figures each Sunday. Our 2021 Black History Month theme is Forward in Faith and features current trailblazers and authors for A Brighter Tomorrow. You will be introduced to both familiar faces and rising stars in the work for justice and equality, brilliant minds and beautiful souls, leaders and risk takers. Our hope is we all will take note of the incredible work God is doing right now and, and empower our faith to continue forward. Now who we are about to meet may appear to be Joy, Corey, and Zaniah, but I can tell you there's more to their story than meets the eye. Good morning. I was born on March 7, 1998, and raised by my single mom in Los Angeles, California, along with my twin sister. When I was just a few years old, I started writing poems and stories. Back in 2017, I was nominated to be the first ever National Youth Poet Laureate of the United States. I'm a recent graduate of Harvard University and believe in the power of spoken words. I especially focus on issues of oppression, womanism, race, and marginalization. I'm the founder and executive director of One Pen, One Page, an organization providing free creative writing programs for underserved youth. Today, I'm most famous for my poem, The Hill We Climb, which I was blessed to recite at the inauguration of President Biden and Vice President Harris. The end of my poem stated, but one thing is certain, if we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with. Every breath from my bronze pounded chest, we will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold-limbed hills of the west. We will rise from the windswept northeast, where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake-rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun-baked south. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover. And every known nook of our nation and every corner called our country, our people diverse and beautiful will emerge, battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. I am Amanda Gorman. Hello, I was born on July 23rd, 1969, and raised in the Caton Homes Public Housing project in Savannah, Georgia. I am one of 11 children who was brought up in a loving and supporting, supportive family. As I like to say, my family was short on money, but long on love, faith, and humor. My dad was an army veteran, small business, his owner, and a preacher. He used to haul, haul old car, cars to the, the steel yard throughout the week and preach on Sundays at the local old church. My mom spent summers picking cotton and tobacco. My mother worked hard to let me and my siblings know we can do anything we put our mind to. 
I was educated at Morehouse College in Atlanta and became the senior pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church at the young age of 34 years old. Ebenezer is the pulpit from which Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. preached. Today, I am the first black U.S. Senator to represent the state of Georgia. My story is a testimony, as I like to say, the other day, because this is America. The 82-year-old hands that used to pick somebody else's cotton went to the pole and picked her youngest son to be a United States Senator. My name is Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock. Good morning, Journey of Faith. I am so glad to be with you today. To begin with, I would like for you to know I'm a political leader, voting rights activist, and a lawyer. Over the course of my calling, I have founded numerous organizations focused on voting rights which are dedicated to hiring young people of color and showing them how to engage with the, the great social issues of our time. Although I'm originally from Madison, Wisconsin, where I was born December 7, 1973, my home has been the state of Georgia. I have earned degrees from Spelman College, the LBJ School of Public Affairs, and the University of Texas, at the University of Texas and Yale school, Law School. After serving 11 years in the Georgia State Le Legislature, I decided to throw my hat in the race for governor for the state of Georgia. In winning the Democratic Party a nom nomination, I became the first black woman to become the gubernator Notorial nominee in the United States. Although I narrowly lost the election, I did win more votes than any other Democratic nominee in the state of Georgia. Even though I lost the election for governor, I have remained active in registering voters in Georgia and fighting against the evil laws which seek to suppress voting rights. Because of my efforts, the state of Georgia elected the, our first black U.S. Senator, Raphael Warnock and our first Jewish U.S. Senator John Ossoff. This year I have been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. I am Stacey Abrams. Good morning. Today's reading is taken from Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, which is the verse that we will be focusing on today, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. May God add a blessing to the hearing and the reading of God's holy word.
to let the oppressed go free. This is the next line spoken by Jesus. Reading from the scroll of Isaiah, to let the oppressed go free. You now, upon reading and praying, thinking and marinating in these words, I almost immediately thought about Aramita Minty Ross, born under the oppressive weight of American chattel slavery sometime between 1820 and 1821, and Marita knew all about the life-destroying effects of oppression. Only five feet, two inches tall, and Marita stood tall despite living out the untold shadowy side of America, where the horrors of 1619 sit with the heroics of 1776. As a child, her skull was cracked when an overseer threw a two pound weight and missed his target, hitting her. But despite all these hardships and difficulties, around the age of 30, Amarita took the risky road to freedom and escaped to the North to let the oppressed, what? Go free. You know, one of the interesting caveats I failed to mention thus far in our sermon series is the reaction Jesus receives from his inaugural sermon. Remember, he's home, back in the saddle again, chilling in his childhood congregation, the Nazareth synagogue. Jesus had returned, in some sense, a hero. He's asked to read the scripture, read from the sacred scroll. Now, you can imagine these scrolls were handwritten meticulously, and like relay batons, they're passing on the faith from one generation to the next. He was handed the scroll of Isaiah. So Jesus, though, chose. He was like, well, let me see. Uh, let me see. Uh, let me see. Aha! Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. God has sent me to bring good news to the poor, release to the captive, sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus rolled the scroll back up, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes on me. Today, he says, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, immediately there was a, a Jesus love fest going on. Right on, Jesus, my man. So you know when you hear a sermon that fits right into your line of thinking, huh, it's the greatest you've heard. When it holds your worldview and doesn't challenge or have any uncomfortable edges, when the preacher speaks about uh, lilies and lollipops, uh, gumdrops and unicorns, yeah, everyone likes that one. But then Jesus goes on to basically say, it's uh, going to be bigger than just you. God's plans, God's purpose, God's reach, reaches far beyond where you are outside of just you. He recalls two so stories from the Old Testament, how God in the past went beyond the in crowd to reach the outside, the outcast. Oh, <laughs> and then the folks got mad. Whoo, sweet Jesus. It's hard to challenge church folks. The message we communicate, you know, today is to move us beyond small-minded, to have God's big picture in mind. How often when we ourselves, church folk, gather, we can get so small-minded. You know, we get mad because there's a misprint in the bulletin. Well, I see some spots on the floor. Or get mad because you didn't bow in the right way in time when you walked past the altar. Oh, I've heard sermons preached from the sacred pulpit that attack individuals especially those who we already heap upon, single moms, broken dads, misbehaving kids, 
gay couples, folks living together, casino dwellers, unbelie unbelievers, millennials, baby boomers, tech savvy folks, tech afraid, individuals that get targeted as if they are the people to blame, to avoid. Now, you've heard me say this story many times before, but it's worth recounting right now. How many years ago, my wife and I were at a funeral for a dear friend, and the preacher gets up and he starts into a long litany of those on God's hit list, fornicators, homosexuals, thieves, gamblers, adulterers. So I leaned over and whispered to my wife, baby, we better get the hell out of here before he starts talking about us. But you know what? I'm just glad today to believe that my life is not in my hands. My salvation is not up to me. Nope, it's not in my hands. I'm liberated, I'm saved, but not because of how I live, but because of how he lived. That my liberation is not because of how I will die, but because of how he died, and how he died on a cross, and what he do. He, on the third day, rose again. And you know what? The same love, the same grace given to me is given to you and given to all of us. That is God's big picture. But my God, whew, we can be so small-minded. It's not that I have no regard for how I live or the manner in which I make decisions and follow God's spirit and how I treat people. Yes, I want God to be pleased more than people are pleased. I want God to be real in my life. When we gather together, when we gather as church, when we come together broken and we're vulnerable and we're stressed because we're human, guess what? God works through us to do mighty great things. Jesus lays it out. Our mission is to bring good news to the poor, release to the captive, recover your sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to declare the year of the Lord's favor. But today, let the oppressed go free. When we unpack and engage the evil of oppression, it's not an issue resolved in the span of a good sermon, or a 30 minute sitcom, or a three hour movie, or a Netflix three season series. No, dealing with oppression is ongoing. It's complicated. Oppression is in the very air that we breathe and in the water we drink. Oppression has been handed down generation to generation, overt, and covert. Think of oppression as a prolonged, cruel, unjust treatment or exercise of power of one group over and against another, often under the guise of good government or the proper use of authority. But oppression is also internalized by both by those who gain from and from those who are hindered by the oppression. One group will internalize superiority while another will internalize inferiority. That's the way that oppression works in such a diabolical fashion. You know the oppressors are cool with the oppressed as long as they know and stay in their place as long as they don't take a knee during the anthem or march in the streets or shout out Black Lives Matter. What happens in community after community, neighborhood after neighborhood, congregation after congregation, where what we begin to witness together is how we define ourselves as those who are in place to continue perpetuating from generations prior which the United States is a white, heteronormative, patriarchal status quo of the past, which reveals itself 
in racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, misogynistic, bigoted notions of biblical interpretation and justifiable mistreatment of those treated who are created in the image of God. Huh, Jesus says to let the oppressed go free. The big picture of God's work, of God's plan, the big picture painted by Jesus calls us out of the friendly confines of the sanctuary and into the streets to be consciously aware of the practice and policies which fortify oppression. As followers of Jesus and not church folks, we are consciously aware and organized to bring forth justice to immigration, climate change, police reform, housing, education, the criminal justice system, to educate, agitate, vote, challenge, and work to let the oppressed, say it with me, go free. Now, one of the greatest issues that is before us and at the heart of the capital insurrection is voter suppression. The violence at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th was fueled by the lie that the 2020 election was stolen. Rampant voter fraud took place was the claim, was the big lie. And where did said fraud happen? Big cities, right? Urban areas. Detroit, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Milwaukee. Those are the areas named for the high density of a black population. As if somehow, when black folks vote, an election is invalid, it's been stolen. Now this is going to be more fodder to feed the lie about widespread voter fraud. There is no widespread voter fraud. So why is this happening? Why is this being told? Well, Carol Anderson, who speaks about her book that talks about one voice, no vote, shows what happened in Alabama. Alabama passed voter ID laws. Now, that sounds credible, right? Sounds like something we should want to have. Will you show your ID to preserve the election, to make th sure everything's fair and square? It's at least based on integrity. But what is behind these laws and behind that law is what also took place. See, Alabama, when they passed the law, you had to have a government-issued ID to vote. Alabama also produces a valid government ID for those who live in public housing. But guess what the voting law said? These government-issued IDs were not valid for voting. Now, mind you, 71%, 71% of people living in public housing in Alabama are black. Then, subsequently, as the law was being passed, mm, the state of Alabama shut down their DMVs, their Department of Motor Vehicle offices in the counties with the majority black residents. So people now had to drive over 50 miles to get the proper government issued ID with no public transportation. So as Carol Anderson likes to say, how are you going to drive 50 miles to get an ID when you can't drive? There is obstacle after obstacle after obstacle put in place to keep oppression in place. So Jesus declares to us as followers of Jesus, the body of Christ, we should work to let the oppressed, what? Go free. To see the big picture at work in our lives and the lives of one another. Today to see it's not just for me to just worry about me, but to be sure the system works for me and for everybody to not be silent and compliant because things are cool for me, it's working for me, sorry about you, but begin again to work for freedom from oppression. I started today speaking about Aramita Ross 
and her fight to escape the oppression of American slavery. But the most amazing aspect to Aramita is what she did afterwards. After she found her way to freedom, after she escaped from Maryland into Pennsylvania, after she got a taste of freedom, she could have lived out her life doing all right individually. But you know what? She chose to go back. She decided to go back to Maryland to cross over the Mason-Dixon line, not just once, not just twice, but over 19 times, 19 times risking her own life, putting her own freedom on the line, 19 times she would go and free 300 people from the oppressive weight of slavery. She once said when she arrived in Pennsylvania, I had crossed the line, I was free. But because my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters and friends were still there, I was free and they should be free. Now the name she gave herself the name we know her by is Harriet Tubman. And Harriet Tubman had faith in God and trust in God's desire to let the oppressed go free. And it's that faith today that we also stand on. It's that faith and trust that God is behind the scenes working for those who are oppressed. We must continue that same work today in working for the freedom for all God's children and fight against all forms of oppression. That is the call Jesus has made. Amen. All right, beloved. Well, as we often stress here, as we hope and pray that God's peace will be with you to get through the times of great stress. Now, we do have a series coming up I want to mention for a moment. It's a Lenten series, Lent, the 40 days prior to Easter. This year begins on Wednesday, February 17th. That's what we call Ash Wednesday. And for 40 days, we're inviting you to be part of Journey Faith Community as we are going to be talking about stress. Now, originally, I was going to call it too blessed to be stressed. But you know what? I decided that's not, I don't know, that's too gimmicky. It just sounds, it's been done before. And the truth is that even with my faith, I still have stress. So instead of that theme, our theme is going to be blessed while stressed. And this is a time of great stress, I know. So let's do this together. Let's find strength in numbers. For 40 days, we'll be taking time every day for a particular scripture to read, for God's word to speak to us. Take intention time, set aside more time in prayer. Every Tuesday at seven o'clock, we'll be meeting together uh, for a Zoom meeting. So be a part of that as we discuss and share about ways we face stress. In our sermon series, we'll also look at that. See, the one thing is, too, that you can't help someone else if you are yourself not in a place to help, right? That's what Harriet Tubman did. She first got herself free and then was able to go back to free others. And so let's take this time to take care of ourselves. It's a stressful, stressful, stressful time. Let's look how God is with us, even when we're stressed. So on Ash Wednesday, the 17th, we'll have drive through Ashes if you're local. Come by the Journey Faith building under the covered overpass area, covered driveway, and you receive Ashes to go. Then join us in the different ways to give of yourself during that 40 day season. And I hope and pray that what you discover is the presence of God, God's peace in the middle of all this stress. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Update on our generosity, where we are in our giving. Uh, good news to report, um, we have made up our difference, so thank you so much, everyone, for your continued support of the ministry. We're actually about $500 ahead now of the goal we have to reach together. Remembering that we're in this together, remembering that it takes a community to work together, to pray together, to give together, so we can be a strong community, a strong congregation, a strong place of faith to go and do the works of justice to let the oppressed go free in the world around us. So please continue to give. Also for Michelle Reed, we raised eight, I'm sorry, $1,860, $1,860 for Michelle Reed and her family to help her at this time. I'd love to get to $2,000. 
So we're $140 short of that goal. If you can give, you know, give to Journey Faith, uh, you can send a check to 7902 Liberty Road, which is Baltimore, Maryland, 21244, or you can see here, give online. Go to our website, journey7902.org, or just give right here on Facebook. If you're giving for Michelle Reed, let us know. Just make a note or email us to tell us that donation was for Michelle Reed. But again, we'd love to get us to a place of $2,000, at least right now, to help their family and care for their mother. So let us uh, now take a moment to close for a moment of prayer. Um, we take this time to speak, to share, to give to God, and also this time to be still, to be silent, to listen to God. So I invite you now to prepare yourself as we go to God in prayer. So let us pray. Lord God, we take this moment to share with you our deepest thanks. And we thank you, Lord, for another day. We thank you, Lord, for all that you brought us through, for all the storms of life we've traveled through, for all the mountains we've climbed, all the valleys we've crossed. Lord, there have been so many times in life that we have known difficulty and uncertainty. And we ask and pray, Lord, for you uh, to be with us now, to be in this moment of history, to guide us through this pandemic, to show moments where your mission is fulfilled in our living right now. And especially then, Lord, uh, grant to us the strength, grant to us the wisdom, grant to us the collective mind to stand against systems of oppression, to work for the liberation of all your children, and to see the world and nation in which we live is in need of a readjustment, is in need of the scales to be even. For all your children have opportunities and chances like everyone else. So bless us as a congregation to have a spine, to have a backbone, and Lord, again, to work, to bring forth a change which is necessary and needed that you've called for to let the oppressed go free. Continue to pray, Lord, for all those in, involved with health care, for all those in nursing homes who battle with COVID-19. We pray for the vaccine rollout, for the continued work, Lord, to grant to us the health and healing you provided, the gift of medicine. We pray, Lord, for you to help us continue to practice compassion and the proper physical distancing as we patiently persevere through this pandemic. We ask and pray you be with our nation, our leaders, our state, and our community. Lord, we ask you to give all of our leaders hearts for you and for your people, especially, Lord, those who have been so often left behind. And Lord, now in this moment, we ask and pray if you continue, please, to bless Journey of Faith, guide us and shepherd us through this moment of history, and allow your light to continue to shine through our, our lives that others might see what you're doing. And Lord, in this moment, we ask you to be with each of us. We pray for our own individual needs, our own illnesses, our cares, our concerns. And we also today place into your hands those who we know are in need of a double portion of your spirit today. We pray for Joy and Monica Campbell, for our bishops Elizabeth Eaton and Bishop Bill Gould, for Pastor Chuck Horn, for Cheryl Cunningham, Matthew McKenna, for Pastor Charlie Marshall, for Charlene Richardson, Gracie Moore, Michelle and Marquita Reed, for Roger Sauter, Nettie Scott, Robert and Deborah Stone, for Carolyn Tyson, for Mark Vernick, for C.J. Ward, for Jamesia King. And now, Lord God, for everyone, we pray, we pray, Lord, trusting in you, trusting, Lord, in your power, trusting in your possibility and the potential you give to us. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who came to teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right, beloved. Well, today is Super Bowl Sunday. I should have been wearing my Browns gear, right, to celebrate a day that someday we may reach. But today it's the Chiefs, Patrick Mahomes against the Buccaneers and Tom Brady. So I don't know how many Tom Brady fans are there out there. Uh, yeah, I know, uh, I know one, uh, Michelle Dorn. Anyone else? Okay, well, I'll be a Patrick Mahomes fan today. Let's just see. Let, let's do one last bold prediction. This is me going on my own. This is just me. There's no spirit used, no PowerPoint presentation, no prognosticators I've consulted. I'm just going to tell you right now, it's going to be the Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl by a score of 38 to 37 and a half. So there you go, a half a point win for the Chiefs. But hopefully it's a good game. Again, y'all, no Super Bowl parties for other people. Let's continue to practice what we got to do to get through this pandemic together. So now receive the Lord's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give to you today all grace, all peace, all power, and all love. Let us work so the oppressed can be free. Amen. I love you. And the greatest news in the world is God loves us all. So go in God's love. And I hope to see you again real soon. Amen.